Hello, everybody. I'm Alexander Rubian with the New Jersey Second Amendment Society. Today, I have a great uh, guest on with me today, uh, Rob Pincus. Rob Pincus is the owner of IC Training Company. Uh, Rob Pincus is a professional trainer, author, and consultant. He and his staff at IC Training Company provide still, I'm sorry, provide services to military, law enforcement, private security, and students interested in self-defense. Rob, thanks for being on. Great to be here, man. Uh, Sorry you're uh, stuck in Jersey, uh, yeah. but uh, I'm glad to be talking to you because New Jersey's going crazy here early in 2019, huh? Oh, yeah. It's, uh, you know, you and I were texting. Uh, every time I opened up my social media, there was another article popping up. And that's kind of why I wanted to bring you on because there was a, a tons of misinformation, bad advice going on. Uh, the two main stories, and we'll link them up for our audience, is uh, the first one, the headline was New Jersey man charged with attempted murder after a shooting car burglar. And the second one was scuffle ends and deadly shooting outside New Jersey home. Now, in the first story, an individual, he, whatever the story was, he looked out his window, he saw his car break, being broken into, grabs his gun, confronts the individual. And then the individual uh, begins to run away. He shoots the individual three times, luckily it wasn't fatal. And uh, now he's being charged with unlawful possession of a firearm, attempted murder, what is, you know, as a, as a professional instructor, and I've seen how you discuss the differences between protecting personal life and pers uh, protecting property. What was your first reaction to this story? I'd say it's negligence. I mean, that's that's reckless and negligent use of a firearm. You know, can, first of all, the whole point of this deal is it's a personal defense network, right? Like personal defense. We want to be supposedly we have these guns to protect ourselves and people we care about. So why are you going outside? to confront the bad guy, right? You use that word, I don't know what word he would use, but we can all agree he exposed himself to greater danger in a couple of different ways by going outside. The first way he did it obviously was physical danger, right? Maybe he doesn't even know that guy's got a partner standing over by the corner of the house looking to see if anybody's watching him break into the car and now he gets shot in the back of the head or stabbed or tackled his gun, because who knows what happens, right? Yeah. Plus the guy in the car, maybe he, he Shoots first. You don't, you don't know. You're exposing yourself to danger. So first of all, you're not doing personal defense when you go outside and confront the guy messing with your car, right? You have car insurance, especially in New Jersey, right? You pay extra for car insurance. Oh, and yeah. you've got to have it, right? Like that, just the way New Jersey works and inspections, there are very few cars on the road that aren't going to have insurance. So I don't want to, you know, even get into the idea that this guy needed to do that. You get into the ego stuff. You get into the justice stuff. You get into what really comes down to vigilanteism. People will advocate. I'm sure there's some guy in some place that's not New Jersey on the Internet after that story. He'll be in the comments right here saying we can't let the criminals get away with it. Nobody's saying let them get away with it. We're saying don't expose yourself to danger because here's what, what else that guy did. He then exposes himself to the obvious civil, criminal and probably emotional aftermath of having been in that physical confrontation. Right. So we can let's maybe he's the toughest, hardest nails guy in the world and he has no emotional aftermath. Let's say he doesn't get sued. There's no civil aftermath. Let's say he doesn't have a social aftermath. His neighbors don't ostracize him. But we know he has a criminal aftermath because he's got charged. Yeah, it's a very good point. So when I looked at this story, there was two problems. First, he was protecting the personal property. And then the second part was he shot somebody in the back that was fleeing away. Yeah. I mean, what I mean, you discussed this in some of your classes that I've been that I've uh, taken with you about you know, when to shoot and what, what, what would be your advice on that situation? Well, what happened? I, I always think, I always hope that the best thing that comes from these events is that when we talk about them, people listening to this, people watching this are going to think about it and they're going to think, what would I do? And, and right away they might be like, yeah, I, I worked hard for that car and I, I, that guy doesn't deserve that. And that's yeah. not right. But then they start thinking a couple levels deeper. And what I want is in the sober moment while you're sitting here in the aftermath of listening to this video chat that you've set up, I want people to think, yeah, it's not worth it. I do have insurance. It's not right, but I can sit inside and call the police. I can grab my keys and hit the panic alarm and maybe scare the guy off or maybe not hit the panic alarm, but hopefully the police will get there. There's a lot of different ways I can handle this that don't expose me to all those negative potential outcomes. And that's a smarter thing to do because if you think about it in the sober moment, right, when you're just sitting here now, you don't get caught up in the emotion. See, that's my fear is that guy, he was the dog on the porch and like the squirrel ran by and he's like, ooh, squirrel. And he goes running out and then he gets hit by a car. Yeah. Because yeah. he's caught up in the emotion, the anger, the ego of how dare you violate my vehicle and my hard-earned personal property and this isn't right and make America great again and 
blah, blah, blah. I think that's what happens most of the time. So the yeah, more we yeah. think about this, the more we talk about it, the more we Monday morning quarterback it, the less likely I hope the listeners and the people you know reading stuff at Personal Defense Network or getting good information from New Jersey Second Amendment Society, the, the less likely they are to get caught up in the emotion of that moment. Yeah, or even better, take one of your classes. I learned a tremendous amount uh, when I took one of your classes, especially in situations like this. Uh, you know, reflecting back, I remember about 10, 15 years ago, actually it was uh, 2011 exactly, uh, somebody actually broke into my car. And I didn't even notice it until the next morning I got in my car and I realized there was an umbrella in my car that was not mine. So what ended up happening was someone jimmied my, uh, my, my door to unlock it, slept in the car, then forgot their umbrella in the car the next morning. Now, plus one umbrella. Yeah, plus exactly. So at least he like, you know, compensated me with an umbrella. I don't think he personally uh, uh, meant to leave that behind. But, you know, in a situation, you take an individual like this, let's say I was going for a late night snack and this guy's, you know, crashing my car, you know, whatever the reasons are, he's doing it. I don't think that's going to constitute a being assaulted and attacked and, and most importantly, being shot. Right. Because even if he did, even if he did, unless this guy has his family heirloom, you know, even then protecting that property would be very difficult. Let's say he breaks in and takes all the change for my thing, for my whatever, uh, three, four dollars and change. Am I going to risk my livelihood, my future over some some rough change over exactly what you said? It's ego. How dare you break into my car and do this and do that? Would you advise people to not even approach the situation and wait for you so don't even go there and try. Don't even go outside and try to. Don't, don't, you know, people say, well, you could turn on the outside light. Sure. You know, you could, I, I like my personal favorite response to that is if you, if you want to make the guy stop whatever he's doing, you're worried about damage, you're worried about he steals your stereo and all that stuff. You hit the panic, you've got your keys right in the house somewhere. You hit the panic alarm on that car. You hit the panic alarm on any of the vehicles out in front. Um, that way it's like, you're not drawing attention. Cause what I were I, like a, one guy I know he's actually a, a good friend of mine and he's a, he's a real smart guy in, in his kind of area of expertise, but really personal defense isn't that. And um, he's a student of personal defense, but he had a situation like this. He went out on his porch, pointed a gun at a guy, shined a flashlight on him, describes it as his wife was standing behind him on the phone with the sheriff's office. And I'm like, dude, you just went outside, pointed a gun at somebody over property, put the light on him, which means now he knows where you are and your wife's in that line of fire. Like, no, you didn't think that through, you know, sorry, you're my buddy, but that was dumb. Yeah, and, yeah. and don't do that. And don't set that example and don't encourage that because if you even turning the porch lights on, well, now the guy, I think, you know, we don't know what this guy's dealing with. We don't know who else is there. We don't know what his motive is. And if he's thinking, oh man, somebody saw me and he gets desperate and he does something even dumber and comes up towards the house, you're not helping. Right. But I do like the panic alarm, obviously call the police, but the confrontation is, is really where it goes downhill. You know, you, the, what, what's your deductible? Thousand dollars, fifteen hundred dollars, twenty five hundred dollars. Your deductible. How much is this guy paying in? You know, like I said, emotional, civil, criminal, financial yeah. aftermath right now. Yeah, uh, chances are it's not going to be even close. Yeah, yeah, it's not going to be even close to what he might have in the car. And most importantly, I didn't even think of this. Uh, what if he did have a second person taking a look out? Sure, you never know. And, yeah. and just, like you look, look, think about it right now, there's somebody in the comments or there's somebody getting ready to type that comment that's going to say, but that's how criminals win. No, it's really not. That's not how criminals win. That's how you win because you yeah. avoided it. Like if I gave you the option today, I could say, you know, tomorrow you can either get into a gunfight or you can, you know, if you go right and you, or you can take a left hand turn and go around the block to get where you're going and not get into a gunfight, what would you do? Well, yeah. if you say go right and get into the gunfight, please turn your gun in because you're a sociopath. Right. Like that's, that's that you go left and avoid the gunfight. So that's all it is. It's you go left and avoid the gunfight whenever you can, because why? It's just not worth it. You're not there to punish the criminal and the criminal can still get punished. Right. Have cameras in front of your house. Take a picture. Uh, take put the video out. You know, start taking video and pictures. Call the police. If your neighbors, you know, if you have if you're friends with your neighbors, hopefully you are friends with your neighbors, you know, get them on the phone or send them a text in the middle of the night. Say, hey, don't go outside. There's a guy out there, you know, whatever. Yeah, I, I really like your, your your you know your thought process here because what if this individual you know did go outside? There was a second person. His wife or kids are in the home. Now there's a confrontation. Let's say he gets overpowered. They're going to look into the house and see the screaming wife. They're going to say, "We got a witness here. Let's right. go into that house and assault this woman. Let's kill her as well." Where the guy could have just locked it, you know, locked himself in the house, you know, and not even uh, escalated the situation. 
to the point where now he put himself in danger. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, in this situation, you know, I have to disagree with a lot of the people in the comments. And I get it. You know, you want to protect yourself. And, you know, you, you emphasize that really well about this is mine. Nobody should be able to take it away from me. But there's all these other externalities that you have to worry about. And if your life is not being in danger, then it's very difficult for you to justify that to not only the court, but the jury to say that my life was in danger and I had to use a firearm or any, any type of weapon to defend myself. And yeah. It really is. It comes down to you putting yourself in harm's way. It comes down to you having made a decision. And this is not about stand your ground. It's not about castle doctrine. You know, unfortunately, there are some studies that show stand your ground laws actually increase the mortality for like middle aged white guys. Right. Because it creates this illusion that you're not supposed to avoid confrontation. Right. Stand your ground laws. Castle doctrine laws are great for the aftermath of when you need to defend yourself because they make the court case, the criminal and civil aftermath, the social aftermath a lot easier to deal with. Right. Well, obviously, I'm a big fan of stand your ground laws and castle doctrine in the courtroom and in the, the, the codes of you know, the legal codes. But what I don't like is when people start thinking about changing their tactics of, oh, I don't need to go hide behind the bedroom door. I can stand in the living room. And if he kicks in my front door, I can shoot him. Why do we keep saying can? Right. It's not about what you can do. It's about what you should do. And why wouldn't you go hide behind the extra door? Right. Call the police and hope you don't have to shoot the guy instead of standing in the living room. And then people want to nitpick or like, obviously, I don't mean if your kids are upstairs in the bedroom, you aren't going to go lock yourself in the bedroom and leave your kids exposed. People get into property like what if somebody's stealing my purse and my kids medicine that they need to survive and they don't take it every hour, they're going to die. And the medicine is in there. Well, then you're not shooting to defend your property. You're shooting to defend your child. And yes. also, by the way, who's walking around in the mall with the medicine and the kid that needs to take the medicine every hour? Like these hypothetical zombie apocalypse versions of tactical, you know, what ifs, they just they get they end up going nowhere. We got to go back to baseline fundamentals. If you can avoid a confrontation, avoid the aftermath, avoid it. But we had so you had another that other story you mentioned, that guy couldn't avoid that. He unwanted oh, he'd right? right into this right now. Deadly scuffle ends in deadly shooting outside New Jersey home. There was a, basically the story, uh, the headline, police say a New Jersey man fought off an armed robber by using the suspect's own gun, ultimately killing himself. Police respond to report of shots fired at Boundbrook home at 7.30 p.m. on Wednesday. Intruder allegedly arrived at the residence brandishing a semi-automatic handgun and a, fire, and a fight erupted with the man who lives at the home. Now, there's a couple things here. They talk about it being an unwanted visitor which I don't know, I think they're playing politics there and how they you know, glorify semi-automatic handgun. I mean, <laughs> what else are you going to use? Uh, it's just absurd the way they're trying to control the language and demonize firearms is calling it semi auto That's a whole other political conversation. In this situation, what did you see as a self-defense expert that was done right and what was done wrong? Or what, was, would you do? what would you do? Yeah, I was struck by that verbiage too, the idea that it was the unwanted visitor was the way they wrote it. But then there is that detail inside the story where the two guys knew each other. Yeah. So my impression is, I, at first I thought, why not just call it a home invasion, right? Like, but now I think, I'm thinking, okay, sometimes I use a scenario when I'm talking to people about, like what I just talked about, calling the police and barricading. If, if there's some guy you used to work with who thinks you got him fired, he loses his house, he loses his wife, you know, he's, he gets drunk one night, he calls you up and says, I'm gonna come over there and kill you, got a shotgun, you know? Standing outside, like you don't go up to the second story window and load your 308 and, and like wait for him, right? You you get the family barricade. I mean, if he's half an hour away, go to the neighbor's house, go to your mom's house, whatever. But if you if the guy pulls up in your front yard and you look out the window and you see the guy just drove up and ran over your mailbox, fired a shotgun in the air, and you recognize him, you don't open a door and be like, hey, Jim, let's talk about this. <laughs> you keep the door closed. You go barricade. You call the police. So that's what I'm thinking is these guys knew each other. There obviously was something. Maybe he, he was an invited guest at one point, but at some point it's like, get out of my house. I'm not dealing with this. Fight starts. Now the gun comes out. And what I love about this story is, you know, I, I, we can complain about a lot of things, you know, in the gun industry and like especially with the current leadership and uh, the regime at the NRA. I think one of the worst things they do is propagate just false narratives and crazy rhetoric. Right. And one of those things is the only thing that stops a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun. And it's just it's just false that the empirical evidence does not support that the only thing that stops a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun. We see time and time again active shooter situations stopped by 
unarmed people that are willing to fight. And that's what we have here. This guy was not armed. Guy pulls a semi-automatic handgun out, right? And he disarms him. And then apparently the fight continues to the point where he still perceives a threat and he needs to shoot the guy. Now, could this be like the one thing we just talked about, right? Because uh, if he if he just grabs the gun, takes it out of the guy's hand, punches him in the face, and the guy falls down and then he shoots him three times, we've got a problem, right? That That's not justified. But if the fight continues, the guy's got him by the throat, whatever it is, he turns the gun around, fires a shot or three or two or whatever it is, and the guy ends up dying or the guy stops because of the gun, great. But at baseline, this was a person who perceived the need to defend himself, was threatened by a gun, and didn't just dissolve in fear or instant death because a gun was involved, right? He fought back, got control of the gun, continued to fight, and obviously perceived that threat was continuing, so he, he ended up having to shoot the guy using the bad guy's gun against him. And this is something we talk about in active shooter response, right? If you're on an airplane, if you're in a hospital, if you're in the bank, if you're in the skid, the kids' uh, you know sports game, you're at the auditorium watching your kids in the spring pageant or whatever, and it's a gun-free zone, it doesn't mean you're helpless. And of course, your kids, when they're 13, 14, 15, 16 years old in that classroom, they're not going to be carrying a gun, whether it's New Jersey, Oklahoma, Texas, Arizona, whatever. They're not helpless. And this story you know, exemplifies that. Yeah. And I think that's a perfect um, segue into the next two stories that uh, we have that we wanted to discuss. And uh, one of them, gunmen shot and killed two hostages rescued after standoff ends at UPS warehouse in New Jersey. Now, uh, in, in, in respect to time, I'm not going to paraphrase every single story. We'll put the links up, let you guys read it, then watch this video again, hearing Rob's, um, you know, uh, uh, focus on it and his, and his opinion on what you can do. But, you know, going into situational awareness, that's, you know, a lot of things you've taught me about. Uh, this woman had a stalker. She had a restraining order against him. You know, typical thing. It's just a piece of paper. How would, it, how would people like this protect themselves? In, in, in a situation that she knows this guy had mental problems, was very aggressive. He has a criminal record. How he got a gun, why he had a gun, you know, in gun-free utopia, New Jersey, with all the strict laws that we have. Uh, you know, so uh, obviously, you know, our work, we always, you know, um, advocate that all they're doing is making innocent victims out of law-abiding citizens like this woman, because that criminal wouldn't care about the law. If he used a knife, if you use an imp improvised explosive or you used a gun, it's all the same for us. We know the story about Carol Bound. She was stabbed to death in her own driveway after she begged the police for 43 days to protect her, give her her gun permit, um, and she was denied that right and she was stabbed to death. In this situation, you know, this woman was in fear for her life. It was very well documented. W what would be your advice to women or any individual that wants to protect themselves? And non-lethal, as you just described, because we can't carry guns for self-defense in New Jersey. Yeah, it, it's it, this story really, more than any of the others, I think, shows the ineffectiveness of things like the magazine bans and the gun restrictions and the incredible difficulty that anybody in New Jersey has getting a concealed carry permit for personal defense. Even how hard it is to just own a gun for home defense or how hard it is to have a gun in your workplace to be prepared to defend yourself or others. It's just they make it so difficult. Right. And then, you know, I grew up in Jersey, still have a lot of family and friends there I just mentioned that, yeah. in December. So so I do you know, I'm very close to this uh, to the situation in New Jersey conceptually philosophically, politically, all that. And then, like I said, family and friends. And it's it's just, it's a disaster. Now, we can't pretend that a gun is going to magically save everybody all the time. The, the will to defend yourself, the awareness, she know. now my questions I have about things like this is, did the people at work know? Did, did the supervisors if anybody sees this guy, if there was security around the, the place where she worked or wherever she was, did, are there pictures in, in the security office? Did she share the information or was she, you know, embarrassed or worried or she was afraid about the stigma? Like she didn't want people to make a big deal about it. I always I hear stories like that a lot. And it bothers me because we as a as a society need to be more open to the idea of defense, defending each other, um, being aware that evil exists and being prepared to deal with it and not think oh, this woman's causing trouble by asking her, her coworkers to look out for her problem. That's her problem, not our problem. Well, well guess what? It was everybody's problem in that UPS facility, right? Uh, this so moment. she did make her coworkers aware of it. Right. So every, so at this point, it became, there, it became a problem because in comes the gunman. And, and at this point, it's really an active shooter response story, right? Because while he did have a specific target in mind, he comes in, fires shots. People see that there's an armed guy, obviously, you know, not a good guy. 
and they then have their the three things we always advocate for evade right be where the bad guy isn't get away you can't get away barricade and sometimes what that means is you have to plan ahead right like i just happen to have my uh my little travel pack here and inside the travel pack i've got medical stuff i've got my medical kit on my ankle that's an extra one but one of the things i carry in here is this door stop right the little wedge and even if the door won't lock or if there's a, a shitty, you know, interior type office door that isn't really solid and doesn't have a good throw or a deadbolt, this can help you secure the door. Um, it, even like a public restroom that doesn't have a lock, uh, the door just swings and usually there's a wider gap for airflow. That's what this side's for. But something like this wedget inside of every office room or in your in your purse, in your backpack, in, you know, wherever you keep your emergency supplies, this kind of thing can help you with barricading. Also, by the way, not a bad improvised defensive tool, right? And I and everything in that bag I just flew with uh, coming back from California yesterday. Obviously, I wasn't carrying a gun when I was out in California, but you know, I have my medical kit. I have all that stuff that um, helps you in the response, in that aftermath. Ultimately, you need to be prepared to fight. Now, what ended up happening was a standoff, a hostage situation, and the, the, the ultimate good guys with guns, right? The, the SWAT team came in and shot the guy. He didn't surrender, and they had to, to put the guy down with, with multiple shots. It wasn't clear whether he shot at the police or whether they initiated the action to keep him from hurting the hostages. But uh, either way, you know, it sounds like there were people that were responding with with the evasion. Uh, but the earlier you see the bad guy coming and the more warning you have and the more thought process you put into how you'll respond, the more likely you are to not have that physical altercation. Ultimately, it goes all the way back to that story we talked about with the, the guy in the home. Somebody could very well have been prepared mentally and physically to wrestle this guy, control him, especially when you talk about multiple people, multiple hostages working together to defeat this guy. Just because he had a gun doesn't make him magic. If one guy can defeat that other person, if there's stories where, you know, women, older people, all every like demographic, there was a, a kind of a scrawny guy at a, uh, a church last year that uh, wrestled a guy with a gun. Um, another one of those weird stories where it was reported as gun owner. Uh, you know, or armed citizen holds active shooter at gunpoint uh, until the police arrive. Kind of made it sound like he pulled a gun out and said, freeze, right? And we actually, it was tackle the guy, wrestle the guy. Two, two or three people took the guy's gun away. They held him on the ground and he went out to his car, got a gun, came back and held him at gunpoint. Yeah. So again, we from gun world try to push this agenda and narrative that we all need guns, but it's no more true than the anti-gun agenda that says, yeah, well, if there weren't guns, there wouldn't be killers. Well, there can be people who successfully defend themselves without guns too and i i hear that in the yeah, that echoes inside of that ups story yeah the police dealt with it well it's interesting because the guy did walk in based on the story he, he, he shot a couple of shots in the air i don't think it was that anyone specific um but he did alarm everyone that he was there sure. by shooting off the things and that's kind of you know the last story we want to kind of go into and we kind of you know how we're going to tie all these in is you know two in critical condition after jersey city mall shooting this ended up being a scenario where we had gang violence, uh, two rival gangs going after each other in a mall, which, um, you know, I don't know how it's possible these people won't have any uh, concealed carry permits because they're gang members and they're probably criminals. And, they, uh, you know, it, it, these are the kind of things that it, it pisses me off a little bit more than the other stories because you're in a public city that you're going to put dozens, maybe hundreds of innocent people in harm's way by having a uh, a shootout, a gang war in a public area like that. It was um, apparently there was a shooting. I, I just read the story like yeah, it was it was on a Wednesday evening, a couple of days before this. And apparently one of the guys in, that involved in this altercation on the, the third floor of the mall a couple of days later is the suspect in the shooting that had happened a couple of days before. So it looks like retribution response, yeah, yeah. violence, whatever, in that public space that, that someone tried to, to take him out. The, the report was that there was a fist fight and then the guns came out. You know, so, you, so when you hear that, then all of a sudden, okay, it's not like there was a sniper on the other side of the mall trying to take the guy out. It looks like there was a confrontation that escalated into gunplay. So it may or may not have been directly related, but it is interesting that here's this guy who's into gun violence, you know, twice in one week. And that's what we hear time and time again. And I think that is an important reminder to people. It's it's the story that really the nation emphasizes with Chicago, but it's everywhere. A lot of times this is criminal based or crime activity based violence. So when we talk about gun violence, 
it's not always, you know, this innocent person that's just walking down the street that gets attacked by, you know, terrorists. A lot of times it is, you know, bad guy on bad guy. Um, you know, the phrase that kind of callously gets thrown around uh, in law enforcement is misdemeanor murder, right? It's like, oh, two bad guys taking care of some of the problem for us. <laughs> as you noticed, it, or as you mentioned, it happens in public and that endangers everyone else. So we can't just rationalize and say, well, it's okay because it only happens in the bad part of town or that only happens in the hood or, you know, well, they bring that on themselves because they don't call the police on the guys they know are the bad guys. That's not real. Here you are in the middle of the mall with everybody and this violence breaks out and anybody can get hurt. And again, it's an active shooter situation at that moment. Um, I, was, I reached over, I grabbed uh, Aaron Donetti's book, my uh, partner at uh, Endeavor Defense and Fitness. Uh, I contributed to this book. Tony Blower contributed to this book. It's, it's a really, it's kind of a, a nice tome of knowledge on uh, everything we're talking about here with the UPS story and now with the mall story on uh, active shooter, active killer, spree killer, whatever you want to call it. Um, he's put a lot of, of time, effort, and energy into codifying a lot of things that, that many of us have been teaching and then putting his own spin on it, evolving it, and really giving people a good system to think about all the components, the medical component, the unarmed component, maybe the armed component if you do have a concealed carry permit. And again, I think all this comes down to thinking ahead of time. So if I'm at the yeah. mall and I've got you know my backpack or my, my wife's got the purse or you know the diaper bag, whatever you got, you've got your medical, you've got your doorstop, you've got those kinds of things. Maybe you have some improvised defensive tools. Maybe you are carrying where I'm carrying right now. If I, I'm going to take the baby to lunch after this, we're going to be out there. I have to start thinking about taking care of her, getting away if I can, barricading if I can't get away, and then ultimately how I'm going to respond. And yeah. that doesn't mean you hear shots on the other side of the mall, and because you're carrying a gun, you pull your gun out and you start Jack Bowering around the mall with a bad guy, right? It just means if you need to, you are prepared to defend yourself, but ultimately, your mindset needs to be evade if you can, barricade if you have to, but always be prepared to fight when you need yeah. to. And, and you know it, that that's perfectly said because uh, well, two things. Um, you just went over a book, and I was going to ask you ask you if that item, the door jammer, is actually available online and on Amazon. Yeah, you get, yeah, wedge it. You go on, go go. Um, I think wedge. you read that right, wedge it. Yep, yeah, wedge. Hit, yep. Hit that on uh, on Amazon. They're like nine, ten bucks. Coming all yep. different colors. Yep, and then the the second the book we're also we'll also link back to that book as well. Uh, How to survive an active, active killer. yeah killer yeah that's uh, that's very interesting. Are there any other you know tools or any type of uh, my book? I mean, let's, okay. it's out of print. Can't get it. Um, uh, sorry. <laughs> but, oh, uh, no, that, that's a big tease right there. You can go over USCCA has a couple of my books now, the Defensive Shooting Fundamentals. You can go on Amazon and uh, sometimes find some books that are on people's shelves. But ultimately, um, personaldefensenetwork.com, that's the best place to go. I mean, hun literally hundreds of free articles and videos covering all the stuff, the mindset stuff, the when do I use force, the what about the home invasion, all the active shooter stuff. It's all there. And, you know, the pop-up window is going to come up. I always tell people, like, if you're not already a premium member, just sign up for the free newsletter or just close the pop-up window and go back and, and utilize the free information we have there from instructors like Aaron Janetti and Tony Blauer. And, you know, we've got a whole team, probably 30 or 40 different contributors there over the last decade, not all of whom teach exactly what I do. Some of them are medical guys. Some of them are unarmed guys. Some of them are like Mike Sieglander. He's a gun guy that teaches things slightly different than I do. Uh, go over there three, four, five times a week. Share with your friends. You know, put it on your social media. And if you're still there in a month, if you're there once, twice, three times a week for a whole month, then go ahead and follow that that pop-up window because you might actually gain a lot of value from being a premium member or taking some of the online courses and all those things. Um, but but take advantage of the free stuff first because there is a lot of information there. Yeah, I got to say I read all your stuff. I follow I, you know I follow your your stories. Um, you know one of the things to really encompass you know after taking some of your classes, you know following your work, you know listening to your advice, it's not necessarily only the skills of how to conceal carry and how to probably shoot a gun. It's also the mindset. You know, and that's something that you taught me really well was about, you know, what do you do in these situations? Most people are like, oh, I just pull out my gun and whatever. And I think that's the wrong thing to do. You don't want to go into, you know, the the, the enemy's, uh, you know, danger zone. You want to kind of flee it and find how to barricade yourself or or de-escalate the situation. And I think that's something that, you know, in the first two stories that we discussed could have probably been done differently. And then in the second, you know, two stories – it discusses, well, how do you survive a situation, an active shooter, when you are in that, even if you are concealed carrying? Because that gun's not always going to save you. It's right. going to, you know, the, you know, you have to have the right mindset on how, when and how, in my opinion, to properly use it. 
Well, it's, you know, Clint Smith has been saying for, you know, 30 years, if, if all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Nail, right? yeah. Only thing you're thinking about is shooting skills and marksmanship and you're running all your timer drills on the internet and all that stuff, USPSA, IDPA, whatever. Then you're you're just a gun guy. You're just a shooter and you see everything in terms of the gun being the answer and it really isn't most of the time, right? I get far more emails and PMs and texts or whatever from former students or just from people who follow the material online who say, yeah, you know, I was in this situation, something you said or a video or I read your book that kicked in. And, you know, I don't know if I avoided something or not, but I feel like I did. Or, you know, I feel like just even the way the the lights and cameras on our front porch deter the guy from, you know, made, I thought something was up. I'd much rather have that than, you know, the, the guy who goes out on his front porch and, and, you know, pulls his jacket back and says, hey, you don't want to be messing with us. And the guy runs away and like all he was doing was trying to sell some solar panels. Right. Yeah. But but now this guy goes home and he's like, gun saved my life. You know, I don't know if the gun saved your life, you know, but that ring camera that you could talk to the guy through and just say, hey, we're eating dinner right now, buddy. Can you maybe come back some other time if you have business? Otherwise, you know, we're not interested. And the guy just leaves and you never had to open your door. You never had to get into a confrontation. You never exposed yourself to that potential risk because you used options and, and some relatively inexpensive technology to protect yourself and your family instead of always going to the gun. The gun is that worst case scenario, last resort. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, we don't have that ability in New Jersey. I would love to carry, you know, for many reasons, but I also think it's important to be properly trained and have that right mindset. So it's, uh, you know, these stories are a very interesting way to start 2019. And, uh, you know, I want to thank you for your time. we got to wrap up. You know, another big announcement is uh, you've just recently become the executive vice president of the Second Amendment organization. Yeah. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that? Because that's more political opposed to the training aspect. I took over the uh, the helm there at 2AO back in September officially. Um, those guys started up uh, a, a 501c3, a nonprofit Second Amendment rights organization for grassroots advocacy at the business owner level. What they were doing after Sandy Hook is they were giving voice and an image and sort of a message to business owners that were oh, that were kind of counteracting the gun free zone movement that started up after Sandy Hook. So you had like Buffalo Wild Wings or Target or whoever say, yeah, no guns allowed in our place. And these were business owners, usually not big national chains, obviously, but like mom and pop, you know, the local car dealership, the local, uh, you know, oil change place, the local restaurant saying, no, if you have a concealed carry permit, you know, we'll give you 10% off. In fact, we want you to find the armed people here. And, you know, just a little subtle sticker in the window, 2AO. At one point, they had uh, an app set up that we're, we're working with another organization to, to populate their app with our database of gun-friendly businesses. And again, it's not doesn't even mean that they want you walking in there, you know, open carry activist style with an AR on your shoulder. They just they're saying, yeah, we support Second Amendment rights. We support responsibly armed Americans. We certainly don't want to ostracize you, and your business is welcome here. So they got off to a really big start with that, and uh, they they reached out to me last year, last spring, and said, hey. You know, we watch what you do. I know some of the guys that are on the board there and, and they uh, said, you know, we've been watching you. I mean, you're really politically active. We know you do some stuff with these guys and some stuff with those guys. But, you know, we'd love to have you make your voice more a part of what we're doing and help us expand our mission. So we talked for a few months, um, sort of talked through all the positives and negatives. I said, look, I appreciate you guys being fans of my work. But remember, the minute you say Rob's here, you're going to also get the guys who are like, you know, we don't like Rob. So are we, we're going to take, you're going to take that PR, good, good PR, bad PR, because I don't say what everybody else says. And I certainly don't say what everybody wants to hear. Um, you know, the whole thing with, with the New Jersey magazine uh, ban that came out in December, right? I quoted you, I quoted uh, the association of uh, New Jersey association of rifle and pistol clubs, uh, Tony Simon, another big, you know, gun rights activist. Great guy, Tony, yeah. yeah. And, and I, I said, you know, here's what people inside of New Jersey are saying in terms of here's your options to comply with the law. And you're not gonna find a Second Amendment advocate, certainly not a Second Amendment organization that's going to advocate people become felons over a magazine restriction, right? I'd say if you're gonna to go to the range and videotape yourself the day after the band goes in with a 20 round magazine and you're gonna shoot it, and and you know, of course we're talking about New Jersey, right? So one of the things I found interesting was like over Thanksgiving weekend, I didn't see anything on the internet with anybody from Texas or Arizona or Oklahoma advising New Jersey gun owners to violate the existing magazine restriction because there was already a restriction in place, right? Yeah. Nobody was saying, 
go get a 30 round magazine and do civil disobedience. But then the day it goes from 15 to 10, all of a sudden everybody's up in arms, right? Do not comply. I'd never comply. Well, it's easy to say sitting in Texas, you know, or whatever. So yeah, exactly. Put it, so putting out, so I was going to say, putting out that yeah. information, even from you, yeah, me into some hot water. Like, oh, Rob, you're a traitor to the Second Amendment. Well, I don't see it that way. So Second Amendment organization now has ending gun negligence, um, things like, you know, shooting to protect property, uh, grassroots campaign, not only for the business owners, but also for the everyday Second Amendment advocate. You know, how do you change minds at the coffee shop? How do you change minds at your workplace? Uh, and then, of course, all the the uh, business advocacy that they were doing. So we've got a, got a lot of things going on at, at 2AO now. People can check that out at 2AO.org. And probably most importantly, if they, people just want to get a feel for more of how I think about guns and gun laws and gun issues, go to gunrights.info. And that's a, a collection of about 60 position statements that I and Second Amendment organization use as a basis for our approach to gun laws and, and all the gun issues. And we sort of look at things where we say we're, we're for something. Uh, we're for, you know, national right to carry. We're for constitutional carry. We say we're against something. You know, we're against the NFA. We're against uh, waiting periods for handguns, things like that. And we say things are complex. And I think that's where people get, you know, people want things to be simple. But we do, in a lot of those position statements, say that there's certain things that are just national reciprocity is a complex issue. Because if it's done wrong, I think national reciprocity is a real loser for the yeah. gun community, right? Um, and then on the other hand, if it's like national right to carry and it's it's more like a driver's license situation where we let the states handle it independently, but the other states honor your uh, legal right to use that permit, I think it can be really good. But it is a complex issue. It's not as easy as saying yes or no. Yeah, we were we were in, in Jan, uh, January 2016 and 17. You know, we were heavily involved in uh, national reciprocity in Washington D.C. And it was a very complicated subject because you have some states that are constitutional carry, you have yeah. some states are may issue, some states are shall issue. And as much as I don't believe that we should have any type of uh, restriction or permit to have to protect ourselves, uh, you know, like we don't get a freedom of speech permit, we don't get a freedom of religion permit, despite religions popping up under the guise of a religion that actually advocate for violence. So it is a very complicated issue and, um, you know, it is what it is, but we were down in DC, you know, we've w very well documented that. We had a uh, former Congressman Tom McCarthy, he became a sponsor onto HR 38. Uh, three other Congress people actually voted for it because of our lobbying efforts. Um, you know, so that actually reflects why it's so important to be engaged, you know, with your local state organizations and be part of that voice because we took these stories from New Jersey to talk about it. And despite us not being constituents of some of these people that we were meeting with, you know, one of our one of our talking points was we're here to protect your constituents against states like New Jersey. Because as much as you and I would probably agree about you have to obey the law and so forth, despite not having to uh, agree with it, you know, there are people that make honest mistakes. Sure. And sure. you know, uh, we get it all the time. I'm sure you see all the stories about innocent people going to New Jersey for whatever, a wedding or this or that, and now they're facing over 10 years in prison. You know, I don't feel that uh, that's right, that people should be going to jail for something that they can legally exercise in, I think, what, 30, 38 states now. There are, most states have reciprocity with each other. So, you know, it's important to be engaged with, you know, organizations like your like yours, other state groups, you know, NJ2As and so forth. It's going to be a, a wild couple of next years, especially until, you know, the next election cycle comes up. But, um, you know, I want to find out more and I want to find out when you're going to have another class in New Jersey. I'll probably be back. I might be back in the spring. Uh, I'm almost certainly going to be back in the fall. So I know right now we're negotiating uh, up at Great Meadows with Cobra One. Uh, in the past, I've done some classes at, at uh, Shooters uh, in yep. Middle East Harbor. I'll probably be back down there again sometime this year. Um, I'll definitely be in Pennsylvania. I'll definitely be in uh, New York at uh, Pioneer Shooting Center. You know, just, just I mean, 15 minutes, depending on how busy the, uh, the GWB is. It's not too, too far from Jersey to get up to where he is, just north of uh, New York City. But, you know, it's, and it's hard to cross at least get it but um i try you know, i do at least one class in new jersey a year i um, appreciate what you guys do um especially i like the whole ethos of the new jersey second amendment society it's the idea that it really is about every individual doing their part and getting involved and when i've come up and i've spoke at some events for you guys or spoke about you and you know we talked a lot about doing more with second amendment society uh i really appreciate you guys doing that hard work and like i said your work directly affects uh, family and friends of mine inside of the state. Yeah, I I know you and your brother are members, so uh, we uh, we 
we thank you for that and we thank you for the good word. Um, how can people find out more about Personal Defense Network and uh, ICE training? PersonalDefenseNetwork.com. Uh, there's a training tour tab. You can hit the training tab and you'll see the tour schedule. That'll get published in February. The tour goes from March until July. Uh, but right now you can go to ICETraining.us and see a lot of the 2019 courses that have already been posted. And uh, more of those courses will be posted over the next month. Because uh, I usually do about 50 classes a year, which is which is a lot. I've been doing it for, uh, I've been traveling now. You know, I had Valhalla Training Center. I traveled before that. But since 2008, I spend 250 to 300 days a year on the road yeah, and yeah. 50 to 60 classes. So uh, hopefully if we'll- people follow you on social media, they'll see your maps of going back and forth and across uh, the country. So I know you're doing a lot of great work out there. Um, a lot of people love your classes. We'd love to have you back. You know, let us know when you're back in New Jersey and we'd love to help you with, uh, you know, your class. Awesome, man. I appreciate it. Hopefully we'll see you out there. I'm looking forward to the day when when you can have something like this in New Jersey again, <laughs> even with one of those. Wow. Wow. Remember that? That is beautiful. All right. We'll get we'll get there. We'll keep fighting. Keep fighting the fight. We'll Thank talk you. soon. Thanks again for being on. See yeah.